Over the last, uh, really, since the very beginning of June, I've been in a series of sermons on when God speaks. When God speaks. When God speaks, He speaks, the Bible tells us, with a whisper. With a whisper. We were looking over some of uh, the material that we were hoping to use for Vacation Bible School. One of the groups of our church is uh, going to be talking about Moses and going through the life of Moses and what God did in his life. And we were looking at this one specific area of Moses and the Burning Bush. And there was a movie that came out in the late 90s. It's an animated movie. We were going to steal some of it, you know, not for money or profit or anything, but we were going to show the kids part of it. And when I looked at the part of Moses and the Burning Bush, it all looked good except when uh, God was speaking back to, or Moses was speaking back to God and, and was saying how he didn't feel adequate to be used and how he said that uh, he was unworthy of it, and how that he stuttered, and how could he go and speak to, to Pharaoh if he stuttered. And in that aspect, then in this animated film, it showed God shouting at Moses saying, I made you, I can take care of you, I will be with you, I will help you. And I, my daughter was there, and I'm like, I don't want to show that to the kids. That sounds like God's angry. Sounds like God's mad and he's, he's yelling at them. That's not the God that I know. The God that I know only speaks in love. The God that I know doesn't shout at us because he's mad, but he whispers in love, in tones that our heart can hear. And has a way, uh, the way I describe it sometimes is, he, he can play the, the, the musical strings of my heart and make songs and melody that's music to my soul with a whisper and with a gentle touch. God's not some God in heaven that's uh, got gray hair and thunderbolts in His hands and He's ready to strike someone down because they mess up in some way. God is a God of love who wants to do His very best for us. And He gives us the voice of of the Holy Spirit, that if you do not know Jesus Christ, He's always there calling you home. But if you do know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, the Holy Spirit is with you. He resides with you. You don't even have to ask Him to come. He's here. You just have to open yourself up to Him while He is there. And the voice of God, the voice of wisdom, the voice of knowledge, the voice of help, the voice of comfort will whisper to our souls the very words that we need. It is God's best for us. And God's calling us to a relationship. He loves us. He wants to give us His very best. So sometimes He'll give us instructions. We look at the commandments and sometimes people say, God's telling me I can't do that, but I might want it. Look, God gives you those commandments because he knows that's what's best for us. It's truth. It's life. It's his will. It's his way. So if we do that, it opens up the doors of heaven for us. We find the bounty and the riches of the love of God. God speaks through his words. But when God speaks, we, we talked about this last week, Sometimes he'll come and say, okay, if you hear me, this is what I want you to do. There's an assignment for us. He doesn't just speak for the sake of speaking. It's to grow us close. So there may be something that God's asking us to do, an assignment for us. And we must say yes to that assignment. And when, you listening? When we say yes, there's an opportunity. Last week we talked about that word, opportunity. It's a navical term where, where it, they talk, uh, the, the, the sea people would talk about when the sail is set up and the winds hit the sail at just the right place at just the right time and, and just the right way to carry the ship to its point of destination. When the sail is set and the wind blows against it to take it to its place of destination, that's what the word opportunity is means ob pertuna, opportunity. But we have to say yes to the assignment. If God speaks and we reject it, 
will never find the opportunity that's from the hand of God. So what happens when we say no? What happens when we say no? Take your Bible, if you would, and stand with me. The verse is up on the screen. Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 30. This term is used over and over in the Hebrew. But in this specific phrase, this is the only time when Paul shares this as an admonition. As a matter of fact, I, I think that of all the sermons that I give and I tell us that we need to listen to God, we need to follow God. It's His will, it's His way, it's His best for us. Sometimes I forget that I need to admonish us as well because this is the will of God for us that we need to make sure that we listen because if we do not, we grieve God. Look what, the, what God's Word says. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. When you trusted God, Jesus Christ is your Savior and Lord. You receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He came to live within your heart. The very third part of the Trinity, the paraclete, the one who comes alongside you to walk with you, to guide you, to help you, to be your strength, to be your wisdom, to be your knowledge, to be the very present help in time of trouble. Don't grieve the gift of God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, give us ears to hear this morning what Paul knew, what under your inspiration he shared. Holy Spirit, you speak the name of Jesus unto us. You paint the picture of our life with conviction and the drawing where you call us to this relationship. You make the Word of God come alive to tell us that which is good and right and best, the will and the way, the truth of Almighty God. Thank you, God, for the second chance. Sometimes I need to learn a lesson the hard way. Thank you for teaching me. Thank you for pruning me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you, Lord, for teaching the same story time and again. And sir, I say to you fresh this morning, I love you. I'm grateful for you. I would never want to hurt you. Teach us what it means, O oh Lord. Speak to us plainly and clearly with eternal promises. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. What happens when we say no to God? What happens when we grieve the Holy Spirit of God? This word grieve, the Greek word, is lupeo. Lupeo. And it literally means to make sorrowful, to cause sadness and grief. It means to make one uneasy or uncomfortable. Now hear this now. It means to offend. Have you ever offended someone? I mean, soon as you, you may not have meant to, it may have come out of the maybe the possible good intentions of your heart, but as soon as you did it, you knew that you had hurt them. You knew that you uh, had offended them. Let me ask you, have you offended God? Did you know that you had offended God? Your words, your actions, the way that you did it, did you offend the Almighty? Let me ask you, what breaks the heart of God? Now this may be a unique word, but it's a human word. And it describes something that is very human for us to grieve. And we were made in the likeness of God. And it, when it says here, when Paul says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit, he is saying that God's heart is capable of being grieved or hurt 
just like yours is. I don't know anybody that wants to be offended. I don't know anybody that wants to be made sorrowful. I don't know anybody that wants to be hurt or be, have to feel uneasy or, or uncomfortable. So let me ask you, how do we grieve the Holy Spirit? I think very easily when we ignore the Holy Spirit. Y'all ever been ignored? I got an oh yeah on that one. That wasn't an amen. Amen, that was an oh yeah. Me too. Have you ever tried to share your love for someone but have it rejected? Ignored? Your love rejected? I mean, y'all, you, did you ever go to someone that don't raise your hands, don't say amen, all right? Y'all hear me? You ever gone to someone and you just wanted to share your heart? You were just, you just wanted to share how much you loved, you wanted to share how much you cared, but they just uh, didn't reciprocate? And how you felt like your heart was going to break because your love have been rejected, made you feel about half that tall. Y'all know what I'm talking about? And yet, the one that knows everything about you, the one who his eyes are on you 24-7, he watches you and prays for you while you sleep. He has his angels working all around you. When you're unaware, the plans of God are at work. He has his best for you. He only wants God's riches of blessings for you. And yet we take him, I dare say, so very lightly. So easily just to make little of his love and his gifts and his blessings. For us to choose a way that God knows will hurt you. Understand this God loves you and God doesn't want you to be hurt. But when you make choices that that He knows if you follow those choices, it's going to bring harm and pain to your life. Any parents here who seen your children make bad choices? And you try to teach them, don't you? You try to help them. You try to lead them. You do it tenderly. You do it lovingly. You, you, you try everything that you can because you just know that it's going to hurt them and it just breaks your heart to see them get hurt. I mean, his way is the best way. And if you choose another way and, and the parent says, oh, this is not going to be in good. This is going to be hard. And yet you, you love them enough to let them make their own choices even if it means it will, it will cause them pain. To ignore God, to reject Him. There is a story in Matthew 19. Let me read it to you real quickly. It's in Matthew 19, verse 16. Just, just listen to me. It says, Now behold, one came and said to him, that is Jesus, Good teacher, what should I do that I may inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, and that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. You know, the commandments. Don't do this. Do this. Don't steal. Don't covet. Honor your father. Do these things. The man said, well, I, all these things I have done, even from my youth. Jesus looked at him and knew. He knew there was something that was in the way. There was, there was an obstacle that needed to be removed. He, he said, take all that you have. Go and sell it. And give it away. And come. Follow me. Be my disciple. Hear this verse. The young man said to Jesus, or excuse me, the young man heard, this saying of Jesus, and he went away sorrowful. That is the same word that is translated 
grieved, for he had great possessions. It grieved the heart of the rich young ruler because he wanted to have Jesus, but he wanted to have all these other things too. And Jesus said, you've got to get rid of those things. They're in the way. And come, follow me. The rich young ruler said it grieved his heart, but I wonder how much it grieved the heart of Jesus. It grieved the rich young ruler's heart because he thought he had to give something up. It grieved Jesus because he realized how much this man was going to lose out on. He was holding to that that really, church, had little value compared to the gift that God wanted to give. It grieved him, but it grieved God. How does it make you feel when someone you truly love makes decisions that harm them? I mean, you try to help them, you try to communicate with them, you try to be patient, long-suffering, and calm with them. You, try, you, you, you want to do what's best, and, and you want to put them first. It's not about you. You want to put them first as God puts us first. I don't understand why the universe, who had everything, would, would give of himself to put us first. And yet that's exactly what he did. Jesus said this, these words in, in Matthew 7, verse 13. He said, wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to, say it again, destruction. Wide is the gate, broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there are that go thereby. But narrow is the gate for the ones who want to choose the ways of God and follow His path. So unbelievers, they grieve God because they reject His salvation. But believers grieve God by ignoring God, choosing the wrong paths. Not believing that Jesus' way is the best way. Taking God for granted. I describe it this way. Putting God on a shelf. Y'all have things that you think are very important and because they're so very important, you put it, you'll have a shelf in your house and you'll put it up there on your shelf because you think it's so important. And you walk by it, and you'll look up at it, and it may bring a fond memory to you, but then you go off and live your day. I mean, most days you'll walk by it and not even recognize it, not even seen it. Every now and again, you may get up and dust it off a little bit. I want to take care of it. It means so much to me. I just think it's so important, and you'll just dust it off a little bit. But most of the time, we just ignore it. We put God up on a shelf. I mean, we want him to be our woman. God, if I, I, I got this. I'm going to live life. I'm going to do my thing. But if I need you, I, I'll call. I'll pray. And, and you better be there. And you better get here in a hurry because you don't understand. I need you. We put him up on a shelf. Listen to me now. What Scripture says, we grieve the Holy Spirit of God, who every second of our being loves us completely and totally and wants God's best for us always. So uh, I, I jotted down some things. How to not grieve the Holy Spirit. Uh, to be honest, this is not a very exhaustive list. I think it's a launch pad. I think it's a place where we can get started. I think as you grow in your relationship with God, as you start to acknowledge that maybe we have grieved Him, that maybe you'll come back to that place where you'll say, Lord, I don't want to grieve you. I want to chase after you. Though you're close, I want to pursue you. I want to pursue you. So number one, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, you need to accept God's great gift of Jesus Christ into your heart. 
It all begins there. You cannot pass that moment of salvation. There's no other way into a relationship. There's no other way that you can know God. There's no other way that you'll ever make it to heaven. It comes by the way of the cross. You have to repent of your sins. Come and tell Him that you believe Him. Give your heart and life to Him. Make yourself a follower of Christ, a disciple of Christ. Put Him first. And by the way, you need to put Him first every day. Not that you'll get saved every day. No. But because we choose ourselves easily, we must make it a point to choose Him. But if you love Him, spend time with Him. Spend time with Him. Don't we normally spend time with the people that we love? I had something happen to me this week. I had 38,000 people clap for me this week. I text that to a friend of mine. He said, you lie? I said, no, I didn't. I was at the Braves game, and I caught a foul ball. And the whole place clapped for me. And I tossed it down to a kid about two rows down from me. I had people go around and said, Man, he used two hands when he caught that thing. I like that's right, because I didn't want it to hurt my hand. I didn't want to be those guys that act so brave out there and drops it and everybody goes, boo. So I had thirty eight thousand people clap for me when I caught it. We we went to the ball game. I, a few months ago, Lynn and I were talking. She says, I want to go to the Braves game. I said, Why don't we go to Gwinnett? You know, watch the triple A team because you can get on the second row down there, you know. She said, No, I want to go to the Braves game. Had been the truest part. I said, All right, all right. We went to the Braves game. So we went down there, and it, it sprinkled a little bit on us, you know, and, and we lost in the tent then. And, and, but we stayed for the fireworks, and about 1230, we were driving home. And my wife reached over in, my, in the car, and she, she grabbed my hand, and she said those words, I love spending time with you. And, you know, that was music to my ears. And here's the thing about it. I love spending time with her. And I want to spend time with her. It's not, it's not a hard thing for me to spend time with the one that I love. And for, for the last six weeks, I've been saying, we need to learn to listen to God. We need to pray to God. We need to spend time with God. And yet some people think prayer is a drudgery. They think prayer is boring. When I have conversations with my wife, that's not boring. I want to have. I will seek her out to spend time with her. And I don't, listen, I don't want to offend her, but, but I understand that there are times that I need to, to have an ear to listen to her. I know I use her too much as an illustration, but um, when we first got married, you know, and I thought I knew everything, and don't y'all act so smug. Some of y'all were the same way. And, and all of a sudden, she would answer me back, and it would be with a different tone. And all, all God's men said, I mean, us men, we know that. Do y'all know the tone? I mean, it was a different tone. And, and I changed. Or sometimes she would give me the look. How many of y'all know the look? And, and I know the look because the look means, Brian, you have messed up. Apologize quickly. Get this thing straight. Say the right words. Repent of your sins. Whatever, you know, right? Sometimes I have, and over now, I've learned the, 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 the signs. And I've learned, I probably, I hope I don't offend her as much as I used to. But Lord knows that I, I know when I, I'm quick to be obedient. I wonder if we could learn to have an ear for God so when with the words of our mouth or the actions of our life and the Holy Spirit begins to be grieved inside of us that we will be grieved and we will be quick to repent and get things back in the right order. And I'll say, I'm sorry, honey, I didn't mean it. And she'll say, that's okay, I know you did Things can be right. Things can be good. Have you ever messed up and didn't know it until later? 
And the longer you didn't know it, the worse it got and the more embarrassing it was. Chase after the Lord. Though He's close, chase after Him. I tell everybody, I had to chase Lynn through a parking lot one time to get a date. But I got a date. And it was worth it. Was I putting myself out there saying I might get embarrassed? Well, yes, but it was worth it. Chase after God. You'll find out that He's very close. Take the Word, open it up, and listen to God. And the Holy Spirit has sharp elbows when He steps on your toes or elbows your side. Be quick to say, yes, Lord. Don't ignore Him. Don't put Him on a shelf. Chase after Him. Develop those spiritual disciplines that keep you close. And invite friends into your life to help you, but also to keep you accountable. I don't know what it is about us, but we, don't, we want to walk this spiritual journey in the collectiveness of the church, but not in a small group or with someone who can hold us accountable. Maybe it's because we don't want to be held accountable. But Jesus held his disciples accountable. And when Jesus just sent out his disciples, he always sent them out in twos. Maybe he wanted us to be accountable to each other. Have somebody in your life that can say, hey, Brian, you're messing up here. I don't think that's wise. Develop the ear of God. Be quick in obedience. This week, Wednesday was my son's birthday. He's upstairs in the balcony. He turned 30 years old. And um, so I took, I knew it was Wednesday. It was my long day. I'd have church and I wouldn't get to see him on his birthday. So um, um, I, I went and bought him a cake and I took it to his work. And I bought a bunch of plates so he could, everybody that he works with could have a piece of cake. Amen. And I saw him and I spent some time with him. And uh, I know the guy that owns the business there. And, and he's, a, he's a dear friend of mine. And we talked a little bit. And, and I was going to work and I stopped and, and, and a place and, and I was, as I was out uh, doing something, I saw someone, and they were walking to their truck. It was a lady, and she had the worst expression on her face, and she had a little bitty puppy dog. And, and I was walking to my truck, and the Lord said, you need to talk to her. And I was like, Lord, did you see the look on her face? Uh, that's a woman. I, I don't want to, my wife's not here. I have to be careful, Lord, in this world that we live in. It's just her. It, it's almost like I, I could tell all the re, Lord all the reasons why I shouldn't do it. And I sat in my truck, and then I said, yes, Lord. Y'all ever do that? You don't say, yes, Lord. You say, yes, Lord. So I get out of my truck, and I'm walking over there to talk to her, and I'm thinking about what I'm going to say, and the car is, the little truck she has is driving off. And then I thought, why could I not have said yes quickly? Sometimes we brag because we say yes when God has to twist our arm behind our back for seconds, minutes, hours, years. But we finally say yes. When my kids were small and I asked them to do something, I didn't want to go 10 rounds with them. I wanted them to say yes quickly. Right? Right? A lot of the times, what I was asking them to do would have been a benefit to them. And yet, we're so quickly to delay. And when we do, we grieve. Choosing our way greater than His way. Don't put it off. Don't put it off. And learn what it means to abide with God. By the way, you'll have to come back next Sunday because that's the sermon for next Sunday is abiding with God. I don't think we're aware of how often we ignore and reject the love of God. I don't think that we're aware of how easily it is 
for us to have other priorities in our life where God's not number one, something else is taking first place. God may be second place, he may be 12th place, he may be 128th place. And I don't think that we realize that when we do such things, we are hurting the heart of the one who only has our best every moment of our existence. Heaven's going to be good. It's going to be the overflow of the every good nature of God. But he has given us the first fruits of that in the spirit. May we never grieve him. May we learn to accept him and walk with him. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, if you're not absolutely sure that you know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, if you're 10% sure or 30% sure, or maybe you know that he's not your Savior and Lord, that's a terrible place to be. You're one heartbeat from a place of spending your eternity away from God when all you really need to do is repent of your sins, believe in your heart, cry out to God, tell Him that you believe in Him. Tell Him that you know that He died on the cross for you. Receive His forgiveness that He paid for with His blood. Give your heart, give your life to Him. Become a follower of Christ. Become a disciple of Christ. Give your life into walking, not just a day a month or twice a Sunday a a month, but every day. Make your life about Him. And watch what what's the miracles that He'll do. But if you're a believer already. Don't take him for granted. He's more than a 911 call. He's more than a trophy on a shelf. He's the King of Kings. He holds your next breath. He always has your best interest at hand. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Bible says come into his presence, but let me just say walk in the presence with thanksgiving. Don't ignore him. Don't grieve him. Say yes.